This is Kreskin, and of course you know me as the amazing Kreskin. I have a very special event, a series of minutes that I'm going to share with you today, and something that you're not accustomed to seeing or hearing me comment on in this way. But I'm going to allow you to take on the experiences that I am reading and referring to from a new book, a brilliant new book. It's called, it's by James Rolfe. And is that the correct pronunciation? James Rolfe. It's a movie making nerd. Uh, I've read this book twice now. It's a uh, book about his growth as a kid into becoming a filmmaker. And of course today, as I understand it, he's become an extremely successful filmmaker. But uh, the rules, the rules, folks, are not quite what you think the rules are in becoming a filmmaker. Did he have a teacher? No, he didn't even live near a teacher because he lived in the East Coast and uh, he had no way at that time of getting to the West Coast where films were being made and what have you. Did he have any people in the family who were making films? No, none at all. He also did not have much money. He didn't have money to purchase equipment. He didn't have money to buy expensive books that explain the technology. And yet, what is he today? No question about it. From the people I've spoken to, he's one of the most successful filmmakers uh, that we have available in the United States. So I'm going to refer to his book, not reading all 300 pages. That is a, a sufferable thing to do, which when you're searching and researching, you do with great joy and pleasure. But that's not exactly what I'm going to do here. I'm going to read a number of excerpts from his book and I'm going to give you the opportunity of simply in a blurred, non-focused way letting your mind just drift and seeing what it brings to your conscious level. Because I can tell you from my own career as a performer, some of the greatest ideas I ever had came out of nowhere. They came out of uh, some story that someone was relating. They came out of something I heard about and what have you. So just let your mind drift. As a matter of fact, it may become somewhat blurred shortly because I'm not concerned that you're seeing specific details. I don't want to limit your brain to an exactness that you would have if you picked up a book and read two two chapters or two sentences from it. I want your mind to just drift, drift and wander. Because this book of uh, James Rolfe is some 300 pages and encompasses everything from his personal feelings, childhood experiences, adjustments, and maturity, the mistakes he's made, and those that he corrected. Because then you're going to get an idea, as I did and was impressed with, how the brilliance of this man somehow came from his inner consciousness and his discipline that he had, even when he was not happy, and even when he was not feeling he could afford what he wanted to do. And what was his ambition? To become a tr tremendously successful pilot and a man who could take through the air with the great movement of an airplane. Now, at this moment, just imagine that you're listening to me and you are listening to me, but you're not necessarily hearing 
exactly what I'm saying because the remark I make with you may cause your mind to drift to some other area. After, after all, you're also interested, very much interested, as was James Rolfe, Rolfe in uh, becoming a successful pilot. You may be all ready. That's your opportunity. But special education school, which uh, James was sent to, added to his adolescence. The college relationships are fascinating, but at the same time, he had to seek employment and believe in it, even if it was not bringing into his life a great deal of money. He also had to consider raising children. Oh yeah, this didn't happen when he was six or seven years old. It started to happen that early in his life. But even as you think of these things, he had to get a job. And the one reviewer comment that you find is how this might have affected him in the future, a childhood hobby becoming a part of his life. Now, let's, uh, let's think about the book. The book starts from James Rolfe's early childhood memories and extends to defining moments of his life, both good and bad, that shaped him as the person we now know today. It gives one a remarkable understanding of what his life has become today. Here you find a reader who read but did not have technology at his fingertips. He just continued to search and search and search. And by the way, along the way, the challenges were such that he wondered how he's going to be able to handle a video. And growing up with the life of challenges that an airplane will offer with the, with the order to accomplish success. You're in for a surprise when you read these intriguing tales in his life. Yes, it's written very honestly with personalizations and thoughts over the top. Some of them are surprising. Some of them don't make sense at first, but maybe that's what's entering your mind. Did your thoughts just shift to something in which there was color or something in which there was movement? You never can tell because if your mind is creative, it can create in ways that you least expect. And certainly anyone interested in the film business is going to be intrigued and contrast his experiences with the reader's experiences and their own personal nostalgia as they look back upon their life. It's like a comedy, a comedian who knows the lowbrow humor, that there is some really thoughtful and touching moments and reflections on losing loved ones, as this gentleman who wrote this book did, and meditations on one's mental health, and that includes parenting, as well as talking about the messages that could be considered inspiring. And it is a unique one that you can blow up and distort your speculation and claims as to what you're going to accomplish or what you believe you're going to accomplish, even though they don't seem possible. Why not keep going with what you're passionate about and excited about? Not for the money, no. In the end, it's not likely to be the money that you're going into this field or the fame, but the very thing itself. It's as much a love letter to independent filmmaking and as such becomes a personal memoir, a memoir which can add and strengthen the things that will be coming about in the days to come. I uh, wasn't manning, in, but in, 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 and now I'm looking at the uh, actual phrasing 
that this young man used because he didn't have much money. He didn't have a wealthy childhood. He didn't have money he could tap into. And uh, when he was working, in order to make money, he wasn't manning the liquor store till searching for a real job, but that's the way he was going to find a real job, as recent college graduates are expecting to do. The Romarks Marx go on to say his greatness, and his greatness exudes pride for his craft. He eats, breathes, and diarrhea dumps filmmaking. And that was a favorite phrase of his, diarrhea dumping, filling making. The art of making movies is synonymous with his own soul. He is unapologetically authentic and has working relentlessly intentions to not falter in his passion to find everything he can on how to fly a plane, successfully use a plane, and make it part of his life. Talk about endorsement and enthusiasm and beliefs, as others will do exactly. So folks, I hope you find this entertaining. He just said that to me right now as I, I read this remark here. It, be, it even inspiring that it may serve as advice or guidance to those pursuing careers similar to mine. And of course, his was the piloting of planes. I include funny stories from my life intended to get a laugh and well as those about growing up and learning from the mistakes and all the personal issues that I dealt with. In general, it's about important experiences that have affected my life, the good and the bad, everything. It goes like, say, thanks to my parents for raising me through my difficulties, sending me to college, and supporting my career along the way. Thanks to the rest of my family, including mom and dad, April, parents, and all my friends through the years. Thanks to everyone who has worked with me on videos. And whether your name is mentioned in my book, it does not matter. My thankfulness to you is as strong as ever. Talk about dedicating and the commitment that this having major success in one's career takes. He mentions, yes, he mentions, James mentions that uh, how important areas of his life were. When I got an audio cassette recording for Christmas, we began to record our life stories on tape. It was my favorite toy so far. We invented voices, our life stories on tape, and different characters like Foogie, Woogie, Funky, Monkey, Ducky Poop. This is where we exercised our toilet humor, and my friends shared every obscene word they knew of. He went on to say that next came obscene photographs that he imagined. I borrowed a cheap camera from my parents and went outside to take pictures of everything, making funny faces and capturing motions of things jumping in the air, freezing and what have you. Back then you had to bring the pictures to a store after you finished the roll of film to get it developed. Sometimes we, we'd wait for a week for the rest results. Often pictures would come back dark and blurry or the lens was never covered as it was as it is today. We go to the to the mentioning my dog PJ, a half collie, half German shepherd, 
often appeared in the photos playing with but with the realm of the stories she was the king of the beast the ultimate in horror when she rolled on her back and spread her legs she became known as the winged terror he goes on to say this author that he was a temperamental child i hated to go to school i ignored my fellow classmates when they greeted me i refused to participate in classroom activities i collapsed on the floor throwing temper tantrums constantly would i eat anything to go then I would go to the bathroom until I, but I wouldn't go to the bathroom until I wet my pants. I was afraid of loud noises such as clapping and laughing and, and would even worry about a balloon bursting because the sudden noise that it makes. I would go near a balloon with great fear that it would pop. I refused to attend any birthday parties. I was antisocial, demanding anything I wanted, and always made self-deprecating remarks, including a suicide comment, which, by the way, I don't really think I meant. Obviously, it caused a lot of concern at the time. He mentions in his book, my mom, he says, felt guilty and helpless, but there was nothing she or anyone else could do. I don't know why I acted that way I did, nor do I remember much of it. So he goes on, and in the concluding remarks, we find that as he played these roles and, and things happened around him, there was a pet cemetery, a pet cemetery that the neighborhood used to bury their dead pets back to where, when they had, were gone. So I was told. Either way, I carried on the tradition. Anytime one of the pets perished, I buried them. There, even dead squirrels or rabbits, whenever I found them, if the pet cemetery wasn't real before, I made it real. As much as I made real of the dreams that I intended to do, when I was going to be lifting from the earth and somehow controlling enough to glide through space. The pl classics didn't need gore and nudity. I was too young to watch the R-rated stuff. Anyway, as I grew up, I gradually I graduated to the Night of the Living Dead in 1968, which became my bridge from the old to the new. After that, I was watching Texas Chain Massacres in 1974 and beyond. I got to experience the evolution of horror in chronological order. Making movies was a pipe dream, I thought, a false hope. I had no actors. I had no connections. I had no social skills, no money. I lived in New Jersey all the way across from the country, from Hollywood. Why did I ever think I could make movies? By age 15, I slipped into depression. I stayed in my room and watched universal monster films. That was my only life. I decided, you see, to make a silent horror film inspired by the classics, Nostradamus, etc. I loved the slow, creepy pace of the haunting atmosphere. With the sound muted, I didn't have to worry about noises around me because the blur and the static and the changes as the film moved on, sometimes not very well put together, as these things happen, my mind just seemed to accept it and it became part of me. I became in, in improvised the plot and kept it vague. I wanted the audience to feel like they were peeking and watching and as they're, as they're peeking they're trying to figure out 
what was happening and dreadfully what might luck and lurk around the corner. Yes, those are the early days of people my age when they first were exposed to horror movies, wondering what's going to happen and what's going to take place around the corner. I wanted the suspense to grow before I or anyone physically could feel the horror building up within me. The bottom line is, what I pursued as I pursue, and this is Kreska now speaking, James Rolfe's book, is that gradually, slowly, with great care, he found his way. He found what worked for him, with not great money, with not great gifts, without his parents paying for everything and doing it all for him. He found what worked for him and what didn't work for him, and what things seemed to be going the way he thought they should and getting results. He found his niche and that thought they should be getting results and, and became the key to his success. It wasn't an overnight situation. It was a lifetime career. And folks, that's what you've heard me describe. And when you read these pages, and that some of them are childhood experiences, and some are funny, and some are frightening, and some reach great su success, you realize that the success in life does not come from a formula or a gift that's given you, let's say, on your birthday. It comes from a dedication, a commitment, a belief in yourself. And by the way, this book is an extraordinary inspiration that you will agree with.